Welcome to Mosaic Church, and thank you for joining us here online. To prepare for today's message, we encourage you to utilize the Mosaic Cincinnati app. There, you can view the message notes, put in prayer requests, and so much more. Enjoy the message. But we're going to continue part three of this series, Good News. And today, we're going to talk about recognizing Jesus, recognizing Jesus. And, and you say, Joe, I've never seen Jesus. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, none of us, all the pictures that we've seen drawn, the movies that we see, it's, it's, it's all imagination. We don't know exactly what he looks like, but that doesn't mean that we can't recognize him when we see him. And so we're going to talk about this today. But the anchor verse of this series is Isaiah 7:14. This is a prophecy in the Old Testament about Jesus' coming. And so it says, Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And as we've talked about the last couple of weeks, kind of my prayer phrase of this verse, the, how, how we apply it to our lives uh, through this series, because the good news, um, honestly, to Mary, when she first, and we talked about her last week, when she heard the good news for the first time that, that you know, God was going to be with her, it literally meant with her. And whether or not she thought that was good news at the time, you know, uh, who knows, but she was willing to be obedient and obey. And so... The application for you and for me is this. Listen up. So if you're here today, listen up. Something impossible is going to happen in your life. And your future can look completely different than your past. See, that's the, that's the miracle of the gospel. When Jesus steps into your life, he can do something impossible. As impossible as it was for a virgin to conceive a child through the Holy Spirit, you know, and with man, that was impossible. But with God, it was possible. And just like Mary's life was never the same after she had that encounter with the angel and after she had baby Jesus, your life, because of Jesus and his involvement in your life, can look completely different in the future than it has in the past. Another prophecy in Isaiah, um, we're going to talk about a little bit this morning, is Isaiah 9, 6. And it says, and he will be called... Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I just love it how Jesus has a lot of different names. And maybe if, if you grew up with an, uh, a parent with an imagination, you grew up with a lot of names too. You know, we have names for our kids that I won't repeat right now because it might embarrass them, <laughs> right? But some of you, you know, you, you might be a little embarrassed to tell your friends all the different nicknames that, that your parents had for you as a kid. But have you ever noticed that names don't really mean anything unless you know the person, right? Unless you know them. You know, the movie Elf has made it famous. You know, if you hear somebody say, I know him, you know what they're talking about. They're talking about, you know, when, 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 when Buddy in the movie Elf sees Santa and he wants everybody to know, to know that he actually knows him. Not that he just knows that his name is Santa, but that he actually knows him. You know, this is why when, when, um, when you name your babies, if, if you have kids and, and, and you, you're thinking, okay, what are we going to name this kid? And maybe you're bouncing it back and forth between you and your spouse, what the baby's name is going to be. And, and I remember me and Jolie were talking um, about one of our kids, and I, I floated a name out there. Oh, I, I kind of like this name. And Jolie's like, absolutely not. We are not naming our kid that because I knew this kid back in third grade that was such a jerk. And he had that name. Has anybody ever had that conversation? You know? And it's like, because she knew that kid, she couldn't get that out of her head. And so our kid could not be named that name because of the association. But people get names and associations mixed up all the time. For instance, how many of you ever heard of Alexander the? Great. See? Ivan the? Terrible. We don't even know these people. It's like, and, and you're going to sit there and say they're great or terrible. It's like, really? How, how, do we, how do we really know that? I was Googling some of these crazy old names uh, this past week and, and found some funny stuff. For instance, there was a king of Galicia from 18, or 1188 to 1230 whose name was Alfonso the Slobberer. <laughs> Alfonso the Slobberer. Can you imagine and apparently he earned this nickname because he foamed at the mouth when he got really angry. <laughs> right? It's, a, it's hilarious. 
But we get, we get names wrong, we get people wrong. For instance, when, when I was growing up and I heard the name Napoleon Bonaparte, and I thought about this because of the movie out right now, I thought it was B- Napoleon Blown Apart, right? <laughs> and so for years in my head, I'm like, oh yeah, Napoleon Blown Apart, I know that guy. But the point is, it's possible to know someone's name, but not really know them. You know all kinds of people throughout history. You know people at work. You know people uh, on your street. You might know their name, but do you know them? And when you hear these descriptors and these names of Jesus, he's, he's going to be wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace. These really only hit home and mean something to you if you've experienced his counsel, if you've experienced his power, his faithfulness, or his peace, right? Because some of you, you might, you might hear that list of names and, oh, Jesus sounds like a really great guy, but I've never experienced any of that. But we know that names are given because of what people see or experience when they are close to a person. When they're close to a person. For instance, there's a nickname for my wife. And sometimes, if you're really, really lucky, you'll hear, you'll hear me call her Chipmunk. And why? Because of an experience that we had hiking on our honeymoon where it was like every chipmunk in the world surrounded us. And it's like, and so, so ever since that special moment and that experience that we had, seeing all these chipmunks in the middle of Colorado, you know, she will forever be my chipmunk. You get it? Come on now. Oh, this is what Christmas is for, sweet stories, right? But you and I, number one, you'll, you'll never have that experience with my wife, and so you don't get to call her chipmunk. And you and I will never have firsthand experience with Napoleon or Alexander the Great or Ivan the Terrible or Alfonso the Slobberer, thank goodness. You know, we can watch movies about these people, maybe not Alfonso, but the rest of them maybe. But that's about it. But the good news for you and for me today is that you can experience a relationship with Jesus. Isn't that cool? You don't just have to know his name. You don't just have to know the stories. You don't just have to know about him. And it's not knowing about him that saves you. It's much deeper than that. So let's unpack the good news today. Who is Jesus? Who is he? Who is he? The first thing that we need to realize when we ask ourselves that question is is number one, and you can follow along on the half sheets there if there's one close to you, or you can pull out the Mosaic Church app. The, The notes are always there as well on the app. So it's a great reason to download the app and and get plugged in. But number one, it's possible when I ask myself the question, who is Jesus? It's possible that I don't recognize Jesus for who he really is. That if I saw him in action, that if I saw him in person, that if I saw him in the flesh, I might not recognize him, which also means that, that the picture or the thoughts that I have about him may or may not be connected to who he really is. And you might say, well, Joe, how, in the world, well, how can you say that? Because we see it in scripture. John 1, 10 through 14 is going to be our text for today. And so turn there in your Bibles with me and let's read the first verse. John 1, 10. It says, he came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. Even they rejected him. Let's pray as we get God's word in our heart today. God, help us. Help us, Lord, to not be people that know about you, but people who really come to know you through a relationship with you. God, I pray for every person in this place, those that are far from you, those that are searching for you, God, those that have been following you for a while, God, every single person in this place, God, let your word challenge their hearts, God, let your word lead and guide us, 
Shine a spotlight on our hearts, Jesus, where we need to adjust, make changes. God, things that you want to completely transform and rearrange. And God, help us to not just hear your word today, but follow it and obey it and live it in your name. Amen. One thing I've learned as I get older is that the older I get, the more I know, I realize I don't know everything. And so if Jesus came in the flesh to the people he created, but the world, and so when we read the world, that could very well include me and you, right? We won't be arrogant enough to think that, that man, we couldn't have been in that crowd. The world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people and even they rejected him. So think about it, even with miracles. And now for us today, even with hindsight and God's word in front of us, even seeing all the prophecies that that were made and now have come to pass, even with the eyewitness accounts that we have in scripture, even with the proof that people have have laid out in front of us over the years. And and if you need proof, I encourage you to read a book by, by Lee Strobel called The Case for Christ. It'll unpack all kinds of reasons why you should believe and you can actually know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus not only was a real person, but is who he says he is. And even with all that, Many people then and many people now still do do not acknowledge Jesus for who he really was. And so to think that you and I would be any exception to that might just be a little arrogant. And by that I mean the picture that you have of Jesus, who you say he is, I would just ask you a really upfront and serious question today and say, are you sure? Are you sure? Because he came in the flesh and the world didn't recognize him. And so no matter where you're at in your faith walk today, I think it's a really good question to ask yourself, do I recognize him? Do I know him for who he really is? Imagine. And it just, I mean, this verse just blows my mind. And, and I kind of I think, think about it like this. Imagine having electricity in your home. The power to change your life, the power to power all your appliances, the power to to work all these amazing tools that we've been given to to do life with, all these amazing inventions, having the electricity in the house, but choosing not to use it, choosing not to recognize it for what it can do. It's right there. All you have to do is flip the breaker, flip the switch, plug it in, but you choose to live in the dark. You refuse to acknowledge that life will work better with the light. Even well-meaning people, religious people, even some people in our nation and in the world that carry pastoral roles, official roles in churches and mainline denominations and and, in different church traditions, don't see Jesus for who he really is. So it's not just the fact that it, it has church on the name of the building. Who Jesus really was is still something that is debated. Some think he was just a good man. Some think he was not really God. Some think he was just a prophet or a really good teacher or just a really nice guy. Some think he was just a historical figure that founded a religion, one of the many that people follow today. Some acknowledge that he was God, but misinterpret the purpose of his teachings. And so all of us just have to come with a humble heart today and ask ourselves, who is he really? Who is he? In Luke 2, 12, uh, it talks about the shepherds, and we're going to talk a lot more about them and some other people next week. But the angel said, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, cloth lying in a manger. We don't get to see that. So that's not our sign. It was their sign. And they went and actually saw him. But the shepherds and the other key characters, they, they were given these signs. We see in scripture, though, that everyone, regardless of their belief, regardless of who you say Jesus is, everyone will eventually experience the same thing. And we see this through Jesus's words 
to some of the people that didn't think he was who he said he was. Some of the people that didn't recognize him. And so in Matthew 26, 63 through 68, Jesus is in court with the Sanhedrin, which was a group of religious leaders who didn't recognize Jesus. They knew that he thought he was the son of God, but they didn't believe that he was the son of God. And so they said to him, I demand in the name of the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the son of God. Jesus said, Jesus replied, you have said it. And here's the the part that we all need to understand. And in the future, you will see the son of man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Let me translate this. Jesus was basically tell them, telling them, whether you believe in me or not, whether you believe my words or not, eventually every single person on earth, believers and unbelievers, will see Jesus for who he really is. And this is a truth that every single one of us have to wrestle with. Then the high priest tore his clothing to show his horror and said, blasphemy. Why do we need other witnesses? You have all heard his blasphemy. Where is your, what is your verdict? Guilty, they shouted. He deserves to die. Then they began to spit in Jesus' face and beat him with their fists. And some slapped him, jeering. Prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who hit you that time? The same type of ridicule, the same type of just absolute pious arrogance happens still today. And it happens when people are um, bold enough to believe and to say that Jesus really is who he said he was, that Jesus really is, like he said he was, the only way to heaven. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus made bold claims. So he wasn't just a nice guy. He wasn't just a teacher. He wasn't just a a religious figure. He was the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the one sent in the world to take away the sins of the world, to pay our sin debt. It's amazing. And whether or not you believe in him today, whether you not you accept his message, whether or not you recognize him, he still came for you. And the question is today, will you live out this verse that says, even they rejected him? Or will you accept him for who he really is? So we all have to consider the possibility that we may not, we may not recognize him correctly. We may not. But the second truth that we're going to look at today is is a lot more positive. It says, when I do recognize him, my whole life is transformed. Verses 12 through 13 in John chapter 1. We'll go back to our anchor's text for, for today. It says, but to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with physical birth, resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. This is that impossible part. Something impossible is going to happen in your life, and your future can look completely different than your past. This happens through this impossible act that the God of impossible does in your life, simply when you put your faith and your trust in Him. When you believe him, when you accept him, he makes you his child, he makes you his son, he makes you his daughter. It's an amazing thing. The words used in this verse in the original Greek is genestai. The words for to become. So to become in the Greek was genestai. Anybody recognize the kind of root of that word? It comes from that word genesis, which which means to become something that is not. And so when it says that you're going to become something, it's talking about something that you weren't before. 
that you weren't a child of God, but then because you accept him and believe in him, you become a child of God. And, and the, the even cooler thing about this description is that, you know, when you believe in him and accept him, he gave you the right to become what? A child of God. That is a, a relational term. It's a family term that you're not just going to be a believer. You're not just going to be a person that follows a religion. No, you're going to be a son and a daughter of God. And what does that entail? It means relationship. That's why when we say, hey, I'm a Christ follower, we're not saying I'm just, I'm, I just follow a religion. No, we, we say we have a relationship with Jesus. Religion is all about what you do. It's like you do X, Y, and Z. And when you do that and you check the, check the boxes off, hey, you're good. And because you did those things, you know, all right, all is good. And hopefully at the end of your life, you're, you're going to have more good than bad, and the good is going to outweigh the bad, and, and everything is just going to be all right. But that's not how it works in the kingdom of God and, and having a relationship with Jesus. Relationship is all based on whose you are, who you belong to. And you, you don't belong to Jesus because you do things right. You belong to Jesus because you believe and accept him for who he is. Right? Right? When you come to Jesus, it's because of your faith and your trust in him. Nothing has the power to bring actual transformation to your life like Jesus can. This, this genocide moment, this, this becoming something that you weren't before can only happen when you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. It's not just about behavioral modification, just doing different things. It's about becoming a truly new person. I'm not really sure how this works. Why? Because I'm a human and this is something that, that God says is impossible, but all things are possible with God. But I, I remember this moment with my son, Jason, and, and I think I thought of this story because my kids are gone in Florida with grandma and grandpa this week, and I'm just really missing them. I'm ready for them to come home. I was telling some friends before service. It's like, you know, it's just everything, everything in life is depressing, and then I wake up, and I see the rain, and it's like, ah, oh, I just want my kids back, right? And so, and so as I was thinking about this this week, I... I, I thought about this moment that I had with my son. Now, he's 18, and he'd probably be embarrassed, you know, telling this story today, but, you know, I remember vividly, as clear as day, the first time he called me dad. And how many of you know it wasn't dad, it was dada. Dad, da. And, you know, the, the symbols were, like, separated, da, da. And it didn't matter how far they were separated, it's like, that counts! He said it! And, and it just happened to be the first words he had ever said. And he's looking at me, and he's smiling, and he's happy as could be, and he said, Dada. And it might have, it might have been right around that time when, when I'm holding him up like this, and he's saying, and he, and he puked right in my mouth, but we won't, talk, we won't talk about that. You know, some of you just puked a little bit in your mouth right now, just thinking about that. But, you know, I remember it like it was yesterday, and since he's the oldest, it was the first time anybody had ever called me that. Right? First time in my life I'd ever been called dad. And the fact that he recognized me as his father and I recognized him as my son, that relationship changed how I saw myself, my life, and everything about life. And if you're a parent, you know what I mean. Changed everything. You know, there was one level of, of the dad life when I first heard that Jolie was pregnant. And then there was another level of the dad life when, when I, I felt the baby kicking in her stomach, right? And then there was another level when I first laid eyes on him. And, and so it was like all these steps. And then there was this whole nother level when he acknowledged that I was his dad. Are you following me? Listen, you need to go from a textbook knowledge about Christ, from these titles, Jesus Christ, Son of God. We toss these around, right? We need to go from this textbook knowledge about Christ to a relational experience with him. Because when you look at Jesus as your Savior, and not just a historical figure, something changes. 
When you look at God as your father, something changes. When you look at him as the savior of your sins, everything changes. You know, I know where and how that moment happened with Jason. You know how it happened? In the simplest way possible. We were just being together. We were talking to each other. Or I was talking to him mostly because he couldn't talk yet, right? And in the beginning, he couldn't talk. So what did he do? He just listened. Kind of like when you start following Jesus. When you start following Jesus, you don't know how to pray. You don't know what to say. You just listen. And as his dad, I would speak over him. I would speak love and encouragement into his life. I would speak things that he was not yet, but he would be. And it was this process of him learning who he was. And it's the same in your life as coming to recognize Jesus as your Savior and recognize our Father in Heaven as your Father. It takes time. It takes time. But God's will for your life is that you recognize Him, and through that recognition of who He really is, your life is completely transformed. Stay on the journey. Stay in the family. If you're not about sure about this whole thing, following Jesus thing yet, keep listening. Because when you do, your heavenly Father is going to speak life into you. He's going to tell you about who you really are. And you're going to begin a relationship. Amen? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says it like this. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. Let's stop right there. There was a time... When you just knew the name of Jesus, and you just had this human view, oh yeah, he was a guy that lived about 2,000 years ago, and he, you know, people say he died on a cross, and, but you know, other people say he was just you know, crucified as a criminal, and, and, and it's like all these questions, okay, who was he really? But we've stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, but here's the game changer. How differently we know him now. And because we know him, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. Man, if that's happened in your life, can we just give God a hand today? Amen. It's amazing. It's amazing. There's nothing better. All right, number three, who is Jesus? First of all, it's possible that I don't recognize him for who he really is. But number two, when I do recognize him, my whole life is transformed. And then number three, nothing says I'm for you like I'm with you. Nothing says I'm for you like I'm with you. We see this in verse 14 where it says, so the word, and the word here that it's talking about is Jesus Christ. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. This is an amazing verse because it describes the fact that Jesus, he was in heaven. He was with the Father from the beginning. The Word was with God and the Word was God. That's how the book of John starts out. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is Jesus Christ. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. And so it's saying that that Jesus left his throne in heaven. He left his place you know, at, as, at the right hand of the Father. And he came and he became human. He made his home among us. You know, that, that word that we use for this, the, the technical, spiritual, theological word, it's, it's called incarnation. Incarnation. And, and that, that middle part, the carn, carne part of that word, it comes from the word that means flesh. You know, some of you know I'm a foodie. You know, if if people just came up with names for me, you know, they they might say Joe the runner or Joe the guy that really likes food. You know, that that would be like if if somebody on my tombstone is going to be like Joe likes food. (laughs) Right. And so when I think of this, I think about carne asada. Come, Come on, somebody. Let's let's go get some tacos. 
But why? Because that's about meat, and it's saying that God put himself in flesh. And so through his incarnation, through him leaving heaven and becoming a man, we can know what God is like. Through his incarnation, becoming flesh, we can know that he's with us no matter what. It was the ultimate sign to show you and me that he wasn't just for us, that he is with us. Now, he had already proved that he was for us. He had proved it by creating us, protecting us, providing for us. We see all these miracles throughout the Old Testament of how God cared for his people, gave them some guardrails to live by. They ignored him. They went and did their own thing. But God did his part in providing a highway for us to run on and to provide for our needs. And if that wasn't enough, Jesus became like us, became a man, walked in our shoes, lived the life that we live, experienced the things that we experience. The Bible says that he was tempted in every way, just like you and I are, but he did not sin. And so he became like us, and then he laid his life down for us on a cross. This is the good news. This is the gospel. And so because he did that, you and I, We are without excuse. We're without excuse. Listen, I want what I want you to get out of this today is that because Jesus, He wasn't just for you; He was with you, and because He lived life and as as a human and walked in your shoes and died for you on the cross, what does that tell me? It means that He completely knows me, and He completely loves me. Many of you deep down believe today that if your loved ones really knew you, if people really knew you, if they knew what you've done and they knew the choices that you make, if people really knew the thoughts that are going on in your head, that they wouldn't love you the same. See, this is, this is the foundational impact of Jesus' incarnation. Because we really believe that if people really knew us and they really knew what we've been through, that they wouldn't really love us. And if you transfer this kind of thought over to God, then you think that if God really knew me and what I've been through in my life and and what I've done or what's been done to me, then he wouldn't love me either. But one of the most powerful concepts of the good news that we see through Jesus becoming human is that you are both fully known and fully loved. Fully known and fully loved. I love how Tim Keller says it in his book about about marriage. He says, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. And this is how people love you before they really, really know you. Because they just love you for all the good stuff, right? And a lot of times that's what we present. We just show people the good stuff. But to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. But then he goes on to say, but to be known and not loved is our greatest fear. That if people really knew us, they wouldn't love us. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well... A lot like being loved by God. It's what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. Isn't that amazing? That God completely knows you, and he completely loves you. And so the miracle is that as we are on this journey to become to know Christ more, as we're on the journey, Jesus has always known us and he's always completely loved us. And so the journey becomes more of trusting him more and more every day. It becomes more knowing about him knowing who he is, learning him, learning everything about him, learning how we relate, learning, learning how to be more like him. It doesn't include you trying to earn more of his love. Is this making sense? You're not trying to earn his love. He already showed you how much he loved you when he died for you on the cross. 
He, only, he already showed you how powerful he is when he, when, he raised, uh, when he was raised from the dead. He can do it. He can transform your life. He can do the impossible. He can give you a new future that's different than your past. The journey is to remember and to rest in the fact that he loves you, that he's for you. Romans 8.31 says it like this. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who could ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? And what is this all based on? It's based on what it says in verse 38. It says, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. What does that tell us? It tells us that when you're close to Jesus, nothing can separate you from his love. If you're afraid he, as he gets to know more about you that he's not going to like what he sees, hey, you just, you just need to get rid of that stinking thinking. Because Jesus knew all about you before he died for you on the cross. He loves you. He's for you. He's with you. This is the miracle of the good news. And so today, as, as, as we wrap this up and, and bring this plane in for landing, what, what are you going to do with it? When you ask yourself the question, do I recognize Jesus for who he really is? Do you believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he's the savior of the world? Do you believe that you personally need him to take your sin and your shame and throw it as far as the east is from the west? And he can do it because of what he did for you on the cross. Do you believe that you need him that much? Do you believe it? Do you recognize that that's what he came for? And when you do recognize that fact, are you ready for your life to be completely transformed? Are you ready to, to become a child of God, to, not, to stop following your religion, to, but, but to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you ready? And then, are you ready to rest in the closeness that you have with your Savior? Then nothing in all the world can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. And you following Jesus in a relationship with him is less about how good you are. It's more about how good he is. And as you follow him in relationship, guess what? Your life is going to look better and better. You're going to start making right choices. You're going to start doing the right thing because you're saying yes to him instead of saying yes to the world. Amen? It's an amazing thing. Your life's going to be completely transformed. And so I want to give you an opportunity for that to happen today. If you could bow your heads and close your eyes today. I want you to think about that fact, that question. Who's Jesus? And do I know him? Do I know him? Let me read this anchor verse while you're just thinking and reflecting on this today. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the Word, Jesus Christ, became human and made His home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Are you ready to recognize Jesus today? for who he really is and what he could do in your life, if you're ready to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, to say, Joe, I've had, a, I've had the wrong view of Jesus in the past, but today I want to acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I need a savior, and I want to acknowledge that Jesus is the son of God and he came to take away the sins of the world, and that includes me, and I want to give my life to Jesus today and begin a relationship with him instead of just following a religion. If that's you today, just raise your hand. I want to pray with you today. Say, Joe, that's me. I want to start a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to start to follow him with my whole life. Amen. 
If you're online with us today, number one, thanks for joining us. But you can raise your hand right there in your living room, in your car, wherever you're watching. You don't have to be here in the building to accept Christ as your Savior. Is that you today? Do you need to follow Jesus? I'll give you one more moment. Is anybody here that says, hey, I need to follow Jesus today? Amen. If you raise your hand with me today, I want to encourage you to, in your own words, from your heart, invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life today. You can pray a prayer that sounds like this. You could say, Jesus, I believe in you. I don't want to reject you today, but I want to recognize that you really are the Son of God and that you really came to take away my sins. And so here's my life. I give it to you. I believe that you died for me and you rose again. I believe you're the Son of God. I trust you with my life. From this day forward, I want to grow in a relationship with you. I want to know you. Help me to know you, Jesus, by reading your word, reading the Bible, and learning to do what it says. Help me in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for today's message. We look forward to having you back next week.